Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this Retina UK webinar. Retina UK are hosting a series of webinars on different topics, and we will be delivering at least one every month. I'm really pleased to introduce to you this evening uh, Gaynor Whitehouse and Lizzie Bartlam, who will be um, discussing low vision services, equipment and aids. Uh, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions at the end of today's um, presentations, and we will be collecting your questions as you think of them as we go through. If you do have a question, please type it in the Q&A section, um, which will be on the bottom of your screen if you have a computer, or under the reactions um, part if you're using a tablet. All of these questions um, will be asked um, by the team on your behalf. So please do leave your questions uh, as we go through today. Um, so although I've just said we will answer all of your questions, we will endeavour to get through as many of them as we possibly can. If there's any we're not able to answer today, we will follow up with these over the next couple of weeks. So thank you once again for joining us. And uh, without further ado, I'm delighted to firstly introduce to you Gaynor. Right, hello there, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm just going to share my screen with you so we can just uh, start this presentation. So if you just bear with me. Okay, uh, okay so I'm now hoping that everybody can now see um, my first slide, which says webinar part one. You can. So, yeah, good, thank you. <laughs> Right, so my name's Gaynor. Uh, I work for Focus Birmingham, which is a charity based in Harborne in Birmingham. My background, I started as a part-time receptionist back at Dons and Aitchison back in, oh gosh, early to mid-90s, just after I left college and gradually worked my way through as a qualified dispensing optician. Then through to move to Focus Birmingham in 2007 where I was lucky enough to do my low vision honours course, and I'm now the clinic lead and clinic manager uh, for the charity. And I've been there just over 16 years now, and I absolutely love my job. So we wanted to sort of take you through sort of what we do at Focus. Um, we are going to look at different um, services across the country later on, but I wanted to talk you through uh, what we do here at Focus. About just literally before COVID started, so about three and a half years ago, we decided that we wanted to try and streamline our services somewhat so that everybody got the same that comes through because not everybody wants a magnifier. And I'm sure everybody um, listening and watching this tonight would probably agree with that. So we came up with these four stages. So we've got stage one, which is uh, information community awareness. So it's getting our name out there. So as people know who we are, where we are, and then what we do. We then move on to stage two, which is our advice, assessment and signposting. So everyone that contacts Focus for help and support will go through this stage two. And this stage two allows us to ask everybody the same sorts of questions. And that looks at every single different part of their lives, not just about magnification, we look at sort of what um, their housing is like, whether they've got family, can they cook for themselves, how do they feel emotionally, all these different things. And from that, we can then try and ascertain where the best help can be provided. Now, obviously, if they do need sort of low vision and a magnifier, obviously, they then go through to people like myself. And we live in the stage three, which is the short term guidance and support interventions. So they'll come along to people like me and go through a low vision assessment, advice and guidance, magnifiers, things like that. What we then want to do is look at putting people into stage four, which is long term and peer volunteer led support. So I'm a huge believer that peer support is just as important as clinical support. And I'm hoping that um, everyone that is listening would agree with that statement. I think like minded people <clears throat> always come up with sort of solutions just as much as sort of clinicians do. So that's really what we do at Focus and how people sort of move through all of the things that we offer at Focus. So Focus Birmingham, we're split into three distinct parts of the charity. We've got the site loss support services, which is where I live. We also have a complex needs service and our complex needs service uh, works a little bit like um, a respite day centre and people that are very, very poorly, maybe with learning disability, 
is maybe with um, uh, long term illnesses. Um, come to us for sort of respite care and we do lots of support with them. We do lots of activities. Uh, we take them out. We do a lot of cooking, a lot of Makaton. If people don't know what Makaton is, it's a form of sign language. Um, for those listening tonight that have got children that have listened to or watched Mr. Tumble, um, Mr. Tumble does Makaton for young toddlers. So we can teach people that as well. So it's a great service. A lot of the people that attend the complex needs service uh, will have sight loss as well. So they do sort of um, jump into sort of our sight loss support services as well. The third part of our charity is Millwood Place, which is our supported living um, out in Kings Norton. So that's in conjunction with Bromford Housing. So we have purpose built flats for people that are visually impaired with um, obviously carers on site. So they can have a look at that <clears throat> and people be as independent as they possibly want to be, because ultimately that is really what we want people to be. We want people to stay healthy and be as independent and really be staying in their own um, houses and homes as much as they possibly can. So um, site loss support services, we do quite a lot within um, our little bit. We've got our site loss MOT, which is what I alluded to um, in the first slide about all the questions. So we look at identifying your needs to find out how we can help you best. And we say need and not want because that's two completely different things. So we're looking at what people need to do. We've then got the low vision clinic and we can provide aids and advice um, to make the best use of people's sight. Um, I dearly wish that we could bring back people's vision. Um, sadly, um, that is a little bit beyond uh, what we can do. So what we can do is work with what people have got. And we will always try and use that to the very, very best of their ability and train them and take them forward to use it within their daily lives. We also offer one to one and a group counselling service. And this is run by um, the BACP registered counsellors. We do either telephone counselling or we do face to face counselling. Um, it is a great, great service. And I'm sure people would agree that it's something that is very, very much needed. There are other organisations that do this, the RNIB, <coughs> excuse me, the Macula Society. And obviously you can go through your GP for counselling as well. Uh, but we are quite lucky that we have um, a counsellor two days a week at the moment. The hope is going forward that we can try and extend that because um, the need is most definitely there. We've then got information, advice and guidance. and These are provided by expert coordinators that can look at, uh, we've helped people to move house, we've looked at filling in forms, we can go through um, applications for blue badges with people, we can advise people where to go when they've got sort of different questions that crop up as go through um, their, uh, their sight loss. We also do a living well with sight loss course. This is a four week course and uh, you come along once a, once a week for four weeks and it covers everything from gadgets to support groups. It's free to attend. You get coffee and biscuits, which is great. Always a, a big tick in my book. And it sort of just covers everything that people might need or don't know about, especially if people are new to sight loss as well. We also have an enablement service, and this helps you gain the skills to maintain and lead that independent life that I've already talked about. So that might be um, help and support with um, cooking. Uh, it could be help and support with using a mobile phone, uh, anything that people need. We also have a befriending team. Um, they're a team that's run by our volunteers um, and they offer befriending and home visiting. The home visiting at the moment, we haven't set back up again post COVID. The hope is that we can do that going forward at some point. And they're there to support anyone looking to socialise with other like minded people, uh, which I think is great. Um, our befrienders um, came to the forefront when we went into lockdown, which I believe I think is three years ago today. Uh, we went into our first lockdown and the befriending, it literally it skyrocketed the amount of people that needed that help and support then. And it has carried on. We also do health and well-being activities and social groups, and these are designed to stimulate your mental, physical and emotional well-being. We've also got um, an AIDS and adaptation shop, which is based in our low vision centre, which where we house all of our what we call our non-optical aids. 
So non-optical aid is anything that doesn't have a lens to it or a power or a magnifier um, and things like that. And people just come along from anywhere and just come and have a look at those things in the shop. So a low vision assessment. So this is inherently what uh, my job is. <clears throat> so what we do is we look at an assessment of need. And as I said earlier, it's about need and not want. So it's about what people need to be able to have that independent life. We can then do a full eye examination and obviously check spectacles as well, should that be needed. We can then move on to estimate people's magnification needs. Now that will be dependent on specific tasks. One magnifier doesn't solve everything. So we can look at different ones dependent on what they need. We can then trial the magnifying aids and that's crucial that we do that. And we actually can train people how to use them as well. Because uh, again, um, Google is a fantastic resource, as is any other um, search engine. Um, but sometimes uh, people order things online and they don't come with an instruction booklet. So a big part of our job is teaching people how to use the aids. We can then look at advice, look at advice. We've got lighting. So how to use your lights, where to put it, the best light to get for the particular person. We can look at contrast, which is sort of like black on white is one of the best contrasts we can get. Uh, so we can advise people how to use that within a home environment. We've obviously got our emotional support and counselling, which we've already sort of touched on. And then there's the referral on to others. I think that's very important that we understand where our levels of expertise lie and where they don't. And there's no shame in that. If we need to refer someone on to someone else, that's what we need to do. <laughs> So finally, on this part of me, I'm just going to go through some of the activities that we do. Uh, obviously, when COVID hit, we had to move everything online. So we decided to do our singing group. We've got a memory lane group where we sort of pick a subject each week and get people to talk about things that have sort of happened in the past. We've got a service user forum. We have an arts and crafts group. We have a VI parent support group, um, LGBTQ plus support group a writing group, a book club, and an oomph seated exercise. Oomph is a very gentle form of exercise that anybody can do, um, but you're sat in a seat to do it and it's, it's great. Face to face, we do a coffee morning. We've got a dance to health class. We do a boxer size group. We have an art group. We have a sailing group. And we also do arts and crafts face to face as well. So that's a very sort of quick run through of kind of what we do at Focus. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now. And I'm going to pass over to my dear friend and colleague, uh, Lizzie Bartlett. And um, she will share her screen now and carry on forward with the next presentation. Thank you, Gaina. So good evening, everybody. I'm just going to try and load up what I wish to talk to you about. So hopefully, um, I'll just get Gainer to confirm. Can you see my slides? We can. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Right. So, oh, this isn't the one I wanted. I do apologise. We are normally very organised. Bear with me one moment. This is the joys of technology. This <laughs> I've got far too many um, screens open all at one time. I'm hoping you can yeah. see this um, slide now. No? no, not yet. OK, I'm going to try that one again. I do apologise. OK, and it is this one that I want. I'm hoping you can see that now. Yes, we're all good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all very much for your patience and thank you um, for joining us this evening. So I'm going to talk um, a little bit more about low vision services and um, starting with what we do at Aston University um, and then moving on to sort of what's available across the UK and how to find that. So at Aston University, our fundamental role is to teach optometrists. And we want them to have the skills to deal with patients who have visual impairment, generally on the high street. So we do teach them about low vision, we teach them about pathology, we teach them an awful lot more than just putting lenses in front of people's eyes. 
And we have the usual clinics that you would expect. We have site testing clinics. Um, we give people spectacles. We give people contact lenses. Um, we have diagnostic clinics as well, where we use specialist equipment um, to sort of analyze sort of people's retinas and their pathology. But also we have what's called our specialist clinics. So within our specialist clinics, we deal with children. So we have a paediatric clinic. We have a dry eye clinic. And I do want to stop up the point of dry eye disease. Um, because if you do have dry eye, it actually, um, it's one of those confounding factors. So things are uncomfortable to do. Um, if we have a poor tear film, um, which is what happens when we have dry eye disease, our vision is also affected. So it actually adds to things and makes things a little bit more difficult to do. So my point there is, is that if you are having itchy eyes or very watery eyes, it could be that you have dry eye disease and it might just be worth speaking to your optician about that um, and to see what remedies they might have. It sadly can't be cured, but it can be managed just to make things a little bit more comfortable. Um, and we do advise people about that an awful lot. We also have um, a binocular vision clinic. So sometimes people's eyes don't work together very well. So that particular clinic sort of is designed to try and work um, with patients certain ways to help resolve that. We also have a myopia control clinic as well. And myopia, a lot of people have heard of as short-sightedness. So it's when people are short-sighted, but the prevalence of that is actually increasing in the UK. And as children become more myopic, their risk of visual impairment later on is actually increased. So the myopia control clinic is actually aimed at trying to stop this myopic progression. Can't reverse it, sadly. Um, can't stop it from happening altogether. But it's, the idea is to try and stop it getting to such a level that people will have problems that will lead to visual impairment later on in life. And they do that with specialist contact lenses or specialist spectacles and monitor the growth of the eye and how much it gets myopic. Um, so that's the aim of that. But also we have the low vision clinic and just like the one at Focus, um, we aim to try and work with people um, to help them do certain tasks with certain tools. So we cannot cure eye conditions, sadly. We cannot restore vision either, just like Focus, but we do our very best to try and work around the available vision that's left to enable people to do specific tasks. Now, obviously, we're very mindful um, that Focus um, and Aston University are actually quite central. So when you can't, obviously, we'll take people from various areas, but when people can't travel to us, well, what happens then? What's, what's sort of around their area? Well, there are another, um, other universities, there's a lot of other universities actually, that actually have an eye clinic. And because they're teaching optometrists, just like we are, um, they will have specialist clinics as well. And they are most likely going to have a low vision clinic that might be easier for people to access. So doing a quick Google around it, and also knowing um, that some of my colleagues in other universities actually do work in an eye clinic. I'm aware there's one at Cardiff University. There's also um, the University of Western England, which is in Bristol. Um, and the University of Bradford, so a little bit further up north than where we are, also has um, an eye clinic as well. And the University of Portsmouth, which is further down south, also has an eye clinic. And further east, the Angular Ruskin University also has an eye clinic. And Northern Ireland also has one as well. So these are all universities that have an eye clinic that are likely to have a low vision service. Because just like Aston, they are teaching the optometrists of the future. And it'll be part of the requirements. Now, obviously, places like Focus have a whole heap of a multidisciplinary team. Um, not everywhere, sadly, has this multidisciplinary team. 
And you probably know an awful lot of people and um, the roles of an awful lot of people that I'm going to mention right now. But we thought that it might be a good idea to sort of introduce you to who's who. So the dispensing optician, um, which is where me and Gaynor started. Um, so they provide optimum spectacles, which also include solutions to glare. And they're also qualified to, um, to supply low vision aids and also perfectly placed to give advice. So you will find that particular person in any high street practice um, that you have access to. The low vision optician or practitioner they're not so widespread and um, they usually are um, you can find them in high street practice um, but they're usually sort of at universities or charities or hospitals these um, people undertake low vision assessments and also do the roles um, listed under the dispensing optician as well because um, usually you become a dispensing optician and then you go on to be a low vision optician your general practitioner, I'm sure you're all aware, they're responsible for the overall care of you and any other patient. So, and their general needs for everything. An occupational therapist, they provide um, ways forward in the workplace to try and keep people in employment and retain employment and enable them to become independent. An ophthalmic nurse, usually at hospitalised services, and they do many of the tests at the hospital. Ophthalmologists, okay, so these are the people who can diagnose conditions. They will monitor that condition, but sometimes the monitoring can be done on high street practice. They're the people who provide surgery and treatment for particular eye conditions. An optometrist, okay, an optometrist, um, I suppose I should explain, because sometimes um, people aren't always um, familiar with the term. It is the optician that tests your eyes. Sometimes people um, think, think of it more like that. Um, the official term is optometrist. And so they're the people who will um, examine eyes, um, prescribe prescriptions, and they can monitor conditions and refer with the evidence that they find in the eye examination and also do the role of the dispensing optician and the low vision optician and these people you will find on every high street practice as well. Right, rehabilitation workers and mobility officers, they find practical ways within the home and can provide training Okay, so white cane training, mobility training to help people get out and about safely. Social workers, these are the people who perform an assessment of needs and will put um, certain care packages in place. Voluntary workers, for example, um, for Retina UK and the Macular Society, um, International Glaucomas Association, um, all of these people are a valuable resource and they are usually have very up-to-date information. They provide meeting groups, counselling and advice, um, such as what Focus do as well with their charity. And also some charities can fund research. And the eye clinic liaison officer, sometimes known as an ECLO, they are a valuable point um, when it comes to diagnosis. So when people are diagnosed, they can um, speak to an ECLO. They will provide emotional support at that point and also practical help, which can involve getting help from social services and certain benefits through the certification process as well. So exceptionally valuable people. The idea is in a multidisciplinary team um, that everyone chats to each other so everybody knows what they're doing with um, a particular person and how they're enabling them. So you don't have too many people um, all at once and also they don't just do the same thing. Everybody uses their expertise to move things forward. So that is the idea. So hopefully good communications. But what can you find in your area? Right. So. I do want to mention that I've mentioned there are people available on the high street practice. Sadly, however, um, that can be a private service when it comes to certain low vision aids. At the university and at Focus, we loan aids. Um, we don't get funding at the university, but we do loan aids because it's part of our teaching programme. Hospitals will loan aids as well. Um, they sadly sometimes though will need a GP referral to access them services. 
But having a quick look on the sightline directory the other day, I noticed that there was a place in Nottingham that actually just needs a referral from an optician. So sometimes the optician can refer you to certain hospital services. So to find out what's in your area, the RNIB have a really useful resource called the Sightline Directory. And if you pop in your location, up will pop um, all the services that are available that have been listed and people have registered onto this site that are listed that are near you. Or you can type in a keyword of a particular service that you're looking for. Um, so it's very useful to find. Um, certain services. Well, I did type in John O'Groats and Land's End. Sadly, there wasn't actually that much very local to there, but it will show you the most local, so the most local in terms of distance. Um, but I typed in Edinburgh and this is what came up. So if anyone's in Edinburgh, there's a site Scotland and they have a rehabilitation and mobility service. Um, so it's, an all, it's a really good resource to find what's near you. OK, so that's the end of my show there. And I'm just going to hand back over to Gaynor, who's going to um, discuss about low vision aids. Right. I'm just going to share my screen again. So and hopefully I'm hoping there we go. Let's just no, come on, please start. There we go. Right. So hopefully you should be able to see part three now. So we're going to be talking about low vision aids in this part. So what I wanted to start with, sort of what is low vision? Um, so low vision, according to the Low Vision Consensus Group in 1999, came up with um, this description. Um, a person with low vision is one who has an impairment of visual function for whom full remediation is not possible by conventional spectacles, contact lenses or medical intervention and which causes restriction in that person's everyday life. So we have that. Um, uh, description. Um, the World Health Organization uh, say in more technical terms, best corrected visual acuity of worse than 618 but equal to or better than 360 or visual field loss of less than 20 degrees. Um, I think both of those are a little bit wordy uh, for want of a better phrase. So the best way to describe low vision is people who still can't see even when they have their spectacles on or their contact lenses in. So it's where the glasses and the contact lenses do not correct the problem um, that that patient has. And I think that's a nice, easy way to describe um, low vision to people. So low vision aids in itself, there are lots and lots of different low vision aids out there. Um, I'm just going to talk about the four main ones tonight. So to start with, we've got our handheld magnifiers. So um, it does what it says on the tin. You hold it in your hand. And it's a magnifier that can be held or carried around. They can be illuminated, they can be non-illuminated. The illuminated ones do tend to be a little bit heavier, uh, obviously because they do have batteries in them. However, having the light at that specific point aimed where it's needed to be aimed, uh, we tend to um, loan out il illuminated magnifiers over non-illuminated all the time. We've then got our second type, which is stand magnifiers. Now, a stand magnifier has to stay in close contact with the page. So it has to be touching the page to move across. Again, they can be illuminated or non-illuminated. Um, doesn't make any difference, really. Um, but using those, again, it has to be on the page. Otherwise, the, that text will be inverted. We then move on to transverse magnification, which is real image magnification, because obviously when you're using a handheld or a stand magnifier, you're making everything bigger as you're looking through the lens. With transverse, you're using an electronic device that is looking at the actual physical text and then you actually change uh, the size of the text actually on the device itself. A lot of the common ones look very much like um, a computer screen. And you put things underneath it and it comes up on the screen itself. You've then got telescopic magnification. Um, and this is where you've got, it's called angular magnification. Um, you'll be very pleased to know I'm not going to go into huge detail about that. I will leave that for the optometry students and the DO students in their courses. So you can look at sort of telescopes and monoculars. So the next slide is going to show you a picture of a hand magnifier. 
there's three different hand magnifiers there um all of different powers we've got a three times a three and a half times and a seven times magnifier and i think this gives you a real good idea of what actually happens when we increase the power of a magnifier so the one as you're looking at your screen now on the right hand side is the seven times and that is the smallest of the three so as we move upwards in the power of the lens of a magnifier the bit you look through which is what we call the field of view becomes a lot smaller something else also changes as well when we increase the power and that's something called the working distance which is where we naturally hold things to read a natural working distance um, does depend a little bit on the person but it can be anywhere between sort of 33 and 60 centimeters depending on how long your arms are mine um is around about 45 to 50 centimeters my natural working distance you can't use some of these magnifiers at that natural working distance so thinking about going back to when we were talking about our low vision assessment earlier and we were talking about training and the use of using these magnifiers that's part of our job as well sometimes the magnifiers can be given out to people and um, they don't get told <coughs> so excuse me to um, hold things closer to them and that can be really really detrimental to people's use of the magnifiers and can sometimes make people think that magnifiers are no good and that's obviously the last thing that we want uh, people to think about so the second one is stand magnifiers so just looking at that picture there the magnifier that's um on the left is the smallest so that will mean it is the strongest now these come with um an, a handle they are nine times out of ten always illuminated there's a nice on and off switch on it which is very easy to use um, the LED bulbs and you can interchange what we call the heads on them. So the actual power of the lens, we can actually take on and off and move it around and change it. If people's vision changes as time goes on, a lot of eye conditions will be um, are degenerative and they do deteriorate over time. So it means it's quite easy for us to sort of move the heads on and off. To use these magnifiers, as I said earlier, they do have to stay in close contact with the page. So that does mean that you do have to either use them on a table. So you've got a nice sturdy surface or maybe use a clipboard and put the post or the newspaper or the magazine onto the clipboard and actually bring that clipboard up. So why would we choose a stand magnifier over a handheld? Well, when we're in our low vision assessment, we're talking to our patients, finding out what their lifestyle's like, what's going on health wise. So maybe if someone has got some kind of dexterity issues, it can be something as though they've got arthritis in their wrists. It could be they might have MS. They may have Parkinson's. They may have a tremor. They may potentially have had a stroke, which means one side, one arm doesn't work quite as well as the other. All these things come in and it, we need people to actually have a steady hand when they're using a magnifier. So stand magnifiers can be really, really useful in that type of um, type of person. And again, showing people how to use them as well. As I said, it's just massively, massively crucial. So the next picture is a picture of a CCTV. Um, as I said, it looks a little bit like a computer screen. Um, what you do is you place the book or the newspaper or whatever you want to be able to read underneath it and it brings up the print on the screen in front of you. These work tremendously well for people that uh, need a strong magnifier because thinking about what I said earlier about the field of view becoming smaller um, as it gets stronger. What that also means is that people start only seeing one or two letters. So fluency of reading is just not possible. So if we bring in these kind of devices, we can get a little bit more fluency back. You can actually change the magnification on these devices. Um, when I started back at Focus in 2007, um, they used to look like this. They've got a little bit smaller as time has gone on, a bit more portable. There's also something that the Queen Alexandra College, which is just up the road from us in Harborne, uh, run every year and it's something called Sight Village which is an exhibition that runs in different places across the country if you google Sight Village um, all the different places will come up 
They do one in Birmingham. Um, they've just moved um, venue this year and it's happening, and I can't remember the name of the place off the top of my head, but it's going to be in Woodcock Street in Birmingham in July. And it's an exhibition for everything to do with sight loss. It could be electronic. Um, we go there, Focus goes there, um, different people go and they've just got stands free to go to. You do have to register, obviously, post COVID. Um, they need to just be looking at numbers and things like that going through. Uh, but it's free, it's a free event and it is really excellent. So if you've never been to Site Village, do Google because they do happen around the country as well. So I think definitely would say that that's something to, for people to think about uh, going to visit. We've then got telescopic magnification. So uh, the bottom picture is a picture of a monocular. So these kind of devices can be used for maybe looking at uh, bus numbers maybe looking at train terminals, airports, things like that. Um, you can actually increase and decrease the magnification of them. Uh, the top left one is a pair of what we call TV glasses. And you can't really see it on the picture very well, but on each side of them, there's a little focusing wheel. So you can actually focus in and out the eyes individually because most people will have different levels of vision in each eye. Then on the top right, we have a spectacle mounted device on a pair of glasses. So we can, again, spec mount the telescope to it. Now, all of the, the top two devices, we would really say to people, they're not really for walking around because they do very much skew your depth perception. So it is for what we call um, uh, stationary distance tasks. So watching television, maybe going to football, rugby, cinema, those kind of things is where we're looking at using that telescopic magnification. A nice easy thing that we can think about is something called relative distance magnification. So what do we mean by that? So some people will come in and say to us, oh, we're really struggling to watch the television. And we say to them, okay, sit closer to the television. And what that does is it effectively makes the TV bigger because you're sat closer to it. And the theory is that that will make things a little bit clearer for you. It doesn't work for everybody, um, but it's definitely worth sort of discussing with people going forward to try that. Again, it does depend on how people's sitting rooms and living rooms are set out as to how practical that is, obviously. But please do suggest that to people um, going forward. We've then got relative size magnification. So basically that's making the print bigger. So whether that be by using a magnifier or you could think about sort of large print books, maybe get um, bills in larger print. Maybe think about getting a Kindle because uh, Kindles, you can increase the font size of them and you've got access to obviously a lot more, a lot more books on in the books uh, that you can get going forward. So the last slide on my presentation for this evening, I call the three B's and uh, we call this bigger, bolder, brighter. So what we want to do for our patients is make things bigger. So whether that's looking at making the font size bigger by using a Kindle, maybe using large print, smartphones, absolutely brilliant for accessibility features. We can ask people to make things bolder. So when people are writing, we need to be looking at using a felt tip pen and not a biro because it's much thicker. Then the last thing is making things brighter. So about lighting and the positioning of where we put that light. If you can have an angle poise lamp, which is a kind of lamp that you can move around, and position that lamp over the task that you're doing. If you can halve the distance from the bulb of the light to what you're doing, you effectively make the light twice as bright. So the closer you have it, the brighter it will be. Um, and that makes a huge amount of difference to pretty much everybody that has got um, any kind of low vision. And to be honest, I think everybody could use that, that tip to be perfectly honest. So that is my presentation uh, finished. So I'm going to switch back over to Lizzie again and she will do the last presentation of the evening for you. Thank you again, Gaynor. Just going to share hopefully the correct slides this time. There we go. And if you can just confirm, if you can see those, that'd be great. That's fine, Lizzie. Thank you so much. Right, so I'm just going to continue forward on the low vision aids part. Um, and we are mindful that magnification, um, it, it really works when there's a central vision loss. And we're very mindful that pathologies don't always present with um, central vision loss. Sometimes people can have peripheral vision loss. 
Um, using a magnifier doesn't actually necessarily help in those instances, because what will happen is that if we make something larger, it can sadly go on to the area um, that is non-working and therefore it can actually make things a little bit more difficult to actually see. So we have to consider other ways. So there are ways to expand a visual field. Um, you can use the telescope that Gaynor talked about and use it the wrong way round. If you use it the wrong way round, it makes things a lot smaller. But because it makes things a lot smaller, it fits all that. Um, I'm sort of being quite, um, quite simple in my terms here. So um, it sort of fits all that onto the seeing part of the retina. So if you've got a good central field, but your peripheral field is actually damaged. Um, so it's not, it's not as straightforward as that, but it, it is like it's sort of squishing as much as it can onto that particular area. Um, Sadly, however, though, it does mean that you need good central vision to begin with, because if we make things smaller, then they can actually be more difficult to see because they're, uh, they are essentially being looked upon as though they're further away. Um, so you need a good um, sort of visual acuity is what we call it um, to start with, because that's going to sadly reduce um, because of the minification. There are other ways as well. So some, um, sometimes people can use what's called a peliprism. And this is where if a person has sort of field loss on one side of their retina, um, it will sort of impose um, the image onto the seeing part of the retina. These are not always that successful. Um, they can be, but they're not always that successful. And because again, there's um, sadly a bit of a compromise, but it is a way um, and it can be worth trying for particular people. Now, um, we've mentioned that you shouldn't really walk around in um, telescopes of any form. Um, however, there are things called a bioptic. And on the slide that I've got here, um, there's a bioptic field expander. So what this does is the person will walk along as normal and view through the sort of main lens and just get a normal view. And when they need to expand that field, they will then stand still and they will dip their head down to look through what's called the reverse telescope. So essentially a telescope built the wrong way round to increase that visual field. So those are some ways that a, um, a visual field can be expanded. There's also technology as well. So on the slide here is an oxide crystal. Now, I've not played with one of these personally, but I do know a person who fits them and um, they, they really do believe in this device. Um, but again, it's gonna vary from person to person. What this does is it sort of um, creates a sort of different type of image. It will sort of remove backgrounds and define edges of objects. And the, they say that it can increase up to 68 degrees of visual field. Um, I do believe that's possibly very dependent on person and pathology. I think that's probably the maximum, but it is possible to do with this sort of technology. I've had a look at the price and it's around about 1,500 pounds and you would require, and people would require with these um, specialist training. Um, so it can be worth people being directed to the Oxite website website because you will then find um, people who fit these across the UK and who've been trained on how to train people in their use. We're also very mindful that vision isn't just about seeing that letter on the chart. Um, that's not the real world at all. Um, the real world is not a black and white chart. That's not what we see on the streets. The real world is actually about distinguishing an edge of a curb, which is very gray, from a gray road, from a gray pavement. So it's about determining sort of these edges and very subtle differences. So sometimes even if we make things bigger, it doesn't necessarily work because a person can suffer from what we call poor contrast. So we have to be mindful about that too. But there are ways that can help when it comes to this. So when people suffer from poor contrast, Gain has already mentioned about making things bolder and brighter. So 
and um, this is true when people have reduced contrast. We can use colours and different combinations of those colours to make things stand out, because that's what contrast is about. It's about determining that difference. We can also use luminance, so making things brighter does in essence improve the contrast. Okay, we can also avoid messy patterns where possible. A very patterned carpet on the stairs is really not a great thing because it stops us from being able to detect the edges so readily. Um, so plain colours and very contrasting colours um, are useful. We can also use filters as well. Um, not always work for everybody, um, but it's worth a play with filters. Some filters will help enhance contrast by stopping certain wavelengths of light and enhancing what's left. And also, um, Gaina mentioned about boulder. So on my slide here, you can see that um, there's this sort of black felt tip pen on a white piece of paper. So sort of big, bold writing and using contrasting colours. What can also help is the electronic vision enhancing systems otherwise known as CCTVs can help with this, that Gaynor also mentioned. And the beauty of these is that they actually do enhance contrast. And not only that, a lot of them have settings that can um, reverse the contrast. So you can have white writing on um, a black background. And this helps particularly when people suffer a lot of glare. It actually keeps the contrast exactly the same because you're using the exact same two colours. Um, but what it does is it stops all that sort of white, bright light and sort of impacting the contrast in the image and from people who suffer glare. And some people, it's worth to play with them because some people prefer different colours to differing backgrounds. So we can all be very, very individual in this. So we can have yellow writing on a black background. We can have um, sort of black writing on a yellow background. There's quite a lot of variance in the settings that can be played with. There's also things called optical character recognition um, systems. And what these do is they recognize um, optical characters, basically. So they can point at things and read things out to people. The OrCam can actually also recognize faces, um, it can recognize products, it can recognize banknotes, um, what else can it do? Or oh, it can recognize colors as well. There's an awful lot of different things it can help people with. There's also a portable version called the OrCam Read as well. Um, so it's a, um, a portable thing that can be popped in the pocket. The one I've got on the slide is actually attached to a pair of spectacles and the person will point that towards something they want read. It can also be programmed to do um, toilet, rec toilet door recognition, anything with text at all. So it's quite useful. Sadly, they are quite pricey days. However, um, I last looked um, yesterday and it was um, about, I think, in excess of sort of £2,500 for those particular type of items. So there are also things that are available on the smartphone. A smartphone is indeed a great resource when it comes to um, sort of low vision devices. There are so many different apps that are available now. So um, a lot of people may have already heard of the Microsoft Seeing AI app, and this is pretty brilliant because it uses the system's camera um, to enable people to read documents, so it reads documents out, it can identify products based on its barcode, it can recognise people based on their face, it can recognise images within other apps, also recognises currency, and it describes a scene in front of you as well. And um, that's available sort of on the iPhone and iPad. So if you have an Android, there's also um, a good version called the Google Lookout. OK, so this um, it now scans food labels and long documents as well. And a popular app I've been noticing um, a lot of people have been enjoying using is Be My Eyes. So this is where you'll have volunteers who will actually um, speak to you and tell you what things are. But having a look at this recently, they're moving forward too. So they, they're creating a virtual volunteer tool, which is currently in testing. 
but it means that this this person this virtual volunteer will be accessible from the moment and at the time um, and it also um, you can type in a message and ask it a question and it will give you an answer so this is also going to be exceptionally useful now another place that is um, great is Henshaws now Henshaws are based in Bolton um, so sadly, they are based up north um, sort of for their resources, but they were mindful of this, that they were only in one place and they wanted to reach out to everybody. So they have what's called Knowledge Village and they also um, have what they call their top 20 apps for phones. And this is quite a great resource because they've actually tested them out. And um, if you look at their top 20, it'll give you um, lots of detail about all these apps and whether it's free, whether it's payable by monthly subscription. And they cover identification apps, reading apps, even social networking apps, navigation apps, entertainment apps, shopping apps and work apps as well. So this Knowledge Village, it's online help. So they have an awful lot of videos where they have tested out apps and instruct how to use them and also other technology as well, such as the Orcam. So it's really useful for hints, tips and tricks as they put on their website. And obviously a lot of technology, um, if you're like me, I'm not always technologically savvy. I'm very grateful an awful lot of the time that I'm surrounded by students who know more about technology than me on many occasions. So sometimes we can be a little bit excluded when we're not technology savvy. So there is a place called Seeability and they deal with digital inclusion. OK, so they can provide um, remote support from home or they have a team of volunteers that can provide sessions in person, too. So if you think you can benefit from that support, you can simply just email them. Now, why is it beneficial to access low vision services or companies? when there's an awful lot online, which I've actually encouraged people to look at. So there are indeed a lot of online low vision companies who do sell directly and they do provide good advice and they are indeed a lifeline to those who are not able to access services with attendance. So that's a really good resource. However, um, Sometimes we can get low vision items from um, not necessarily low vision companies. We can just get them off any particular selling website. And it's not always clear exactly what they're selling. So I've got an image here of this wonderful thing, which does indeed have a beautiful LED light, which is quite fantastic because, as um, Gaynor mentioned, lighting is really valuable for all retinal conditions, whether it's peripheral loss, patch field loss or central loss. But what um, struck me with this particular thing, it said 200% magnifying glasses with light. Now that 200%, um, it said 200% magnifying. Well, magnification isn't really in that sort of unit. 200 times magnification just wouldn't be possible really, unless you had a very high powered microscope, it's sort of within that field. What this is actually alluding to is the power. Um, so what it's saying is it's magnified something 200 times. So in essence, that's only two times because you have to sort of quadruple the power. So what I mean by that, I'll explain. If I have a lens that's um, a plus four diopter lens, so you may have seen that on your prescription, I'd have to increase that to eight diopters to give myself what's called a unit magnification of two times. It doesn't necessarily work as two times, um, but it's labelled as two times. This one is 200% magnifying, and actually all it's doing is it's, it's also just two times. It's not actually 200%. So it can be a really good idea to actually go through the low vision companies or just get um, access advice on anything you wish to purchase online to make sure it is what you, and I'll say that word again, anticipated it to be. So thank you very much for listening. And I've just got an image here of my most favorite spectacle wearer in the entire world. So I'll just stop sharing now. And I think we're opening up for question and answers.
Thank you both. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, what I am going to ask you to do is if you can switch your cameras on, because we've not been able to see your lovely faces so far. There you go. There's Gaynor. And there's Lizzie. So um, thanks again for that. That was absolutely fantastic. So um, we have got some time for questions. So please do leave your questions down in the Q&A section. Um, so I just want to just kind of clarify. So, if if somebody's looking to have um, a low vision assessment to you know to gain access to some of these services, what is the best way for them to do that? It's probably going to be very dependent on where they are in the country and to what their provider is asking for. Focus. We have an open referral system. Our only proviso is that you have to be registered with a Birmingham GP or pay your council tax to Birmingham. And that is purely to do with where um, our funding comes from because we are a charity. Okay. I believe so if, if, Aston, anyone can go. Yes, um, we, we operate self referral, um, referrals from anybody, um, and we can take anyone across the country um, purely because we don't have any funding. Um, but obviously, we want to teach optometrists the best um, way forward, and the best people to learn from is the actual end user. Um, and so we do wish to loan aids to patients so we can train optometrists. Fabulous. So um, I understand as well that people can just go to their um, optician as well uh, and ask for a referral or even through their GP mm -hmm. um, as well, um, which is fantastic. Now, I know you said earlier that about um, loaning equipment. Um, to what extent does that extend? So um, we've kind of talked about some of the pricier items, you know, like the all cams and the, the smart glasses and things. So could somebody come along and expect to... Um, to, to borrow um, a £3,000 CCTV system? Um, they might well do. Um, unfortunately, um, funds don't go quite that far, sadly. Um, all magnifiers um, are, are given on permanent, what we call permanent loan from Focus. Uh, so anything um, sort of like a hand, a stand, a telescope, um, they wouldn't be expected to pay for those. The CCTVs and the electronic devices and the non-optical aids unfortunately there is um, a price tag with those i really wish there wasn't and it just comes down to one of us winning the euro millions at some point and <laughs> wouldn't it be nice yes wouldn't wouldn't it? Be nice. <laughs> fantastic having, um, having said that about the electronic devices though we do sometimes get a bit caught up in how much they cost and i think we shouldn't be judging people on what they can and can't afford um, we should always be sort of showing people what's out there because it could be a huge benefit for them. Brilliant, that's fantastic. Um, so here's a bit of um, maybe an impossible question to ask. Um, so as you, as you know, people with, um, with our range of conditions obviously is progressive in nature. Um, we often get asked about um, what's the best light for me to use for a particular task? What kind of advice or information could you impart around lighting? In the next few minutes yeah it's very subjective would you agree lizzie yeah it's very very dependent which is why a lot of the lights nowadays are quite sensible and um, to cater everybody and come with a variety of settings um, because it really is individual even down to the color of the light let alone the brightness fantastic okay that's brilliant i mean obviously we, we, we're in a kind of a technological age now where we have these smart speakers and I can't say a particular name because it will kind of go off in the background if I use one um, but obviously we can use that to kind of adjust light levels and bits and pieces as well um, you know, to, to, to kind of dim to a certain level or even um, you know change to a different of set of lumens you know a, a bright white or a, a cool white whatever it may be um, so I think we're in exciting times from uh, from, from that perspective. So you've got some questions coming through. Um, ain't hard to get tonight. Come on, guys, ask your questions. We've got a couple more minutes. So any any advice in relation to um, the um, you're saying like about filters and things, Lizzie? Um, are we talking kind of electronic filters or kind of things you can stick over your smartphones? 
oh right so i um should have clarified i was i was more um talking about sort of filters that you wear so um sort of um, contrast enhancing filters obviously you can have filters as well for glare as well mm -hmm. um, um if you suffer glare so it's more i was more talking about that sorry yeah i don't oh, know if Kane oh. knows more about smartphone filters not really <laughs> <laughs> this is a very quick answer to that. This is where I'm not technologically savvy. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's that's fine. I, th I think again, we, we we're kind of in that um in those times where there is just so many things that are kind of coming up. Um, you know, for again for our range of conditions like blue light filters and things for smartphones is kind of a, a big topic at the moment as well. We also, we've stopped helping people uh, keep their circadian rhythm and kind of going to sleep and not waking up in the middle of the night from. Uh, looking at their smartphones and things uh, too much. All right, well, I think we've kind of, we have actually come to eight o'clock. Um, that was a huge amount of information, which was absolutely wonderful. I learned a huge amount. Um, we will be sharing the presentations uh, with people afterwards. So um, please accept our huge thanks for, for joining us this evening. Um, a little bit of information just to let everybody know. Um, so as I say, massive thank you to, um, to Gaynor and Lizzie for joining us. Fantastic presentations. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning of the evening, Retina UK will be delivering at least one webinar every month. Uh, the next of which is on Thursday, the 18th of April, uh, where we will explore the many ways that you can get involved with Retina UK and details on how you can join that session um, and how you're able to uh, to join us, we'll, um, you can find it on our website and I'll also send out the information on an email, which I will talk to you about shortly. Um, I have to remind you that Retin UK is a registered charity, much like Focus Birmingham is. Uh, so we receive no government funding and we rely on our wonderful supporters to raise the funds needed to provide vital services such as these webinars and invest in groundbreaking medical research. So securing support from companies um, is one way that, um, that you can do some fundraising. So if your um, employer has a, um, a workplace fundraising scheme, um, you can support Retin UK by making us one of your charities of the year. So if you'd like to know a little bit more information about that, you can contact our fundraising team uh, either via email, which is fundraising at retinauk.org.uk, or you can give the guys a call on 01280 So we will be sending out an email um, over the next couple of days, which will have a, a link to where you can watch uh, this evening's fantastic presentations again, uh, and details on how you can book onto our other events that we have coming up throughout the year. But we will also be seeking your feedback on today's session. We value all feedback. Uh, and yours will help us to, to develop our webinars and other services as we go forwards. So once again, Gaynor and Lizzie, thank you ever so much for joining us this evening. And to you all at home, thank you very much and good night to you.